Um, Jill, it's just ticked over 7.02 yep. and we've got a few people starting to, to roll in. So um, I know you organised a, um, a little poll, a little questionnaire yep. to, to get started tonight. So do you want to kick things off? Sure. All right. This poll going. Hopefully everybody can see that. So we like to kick off these sessions, everyone, with a little bit of a poll to get a, get a bit of information about where everyone feels like they're at. And hopefully that's something that I can reference again um, later on. Just gives me a little bit of information. Jill, I always forget that I have to give this answer as well. Yeah. My physical activity increased during isolation. You might be the only one. I'm sure I'm not. I'm sure there's two groups of people out there, people who increase their physical activity exponentially uh, and people who decrease their physical ac activity exponentially too. Once we get to about eighty percent of people who have uh, who yeah. answered that, do you wanna? All right, finish that off. We've got just about everybody. Um, are you able to see that? So hopefully everybody can now see the results, and they're pretty much in line with what a little bit of research shows that I'm gonna present a little bit later. Um, physical activity for most people has decreased uh, during our isolation period. And people, everyone having a bit of a stab, stab at about how much strength they lost, 15%, we'll cover that in the research a little bit later on as well. Uh, as we will question number three about how long it took you to regain your strength between four weeks and, and six weeks. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how close that is um, to what the research suggests for us. So um, we might kick off and um, welcome everybody who's, who's here. Uh, my name is Tim Detman. I'm a physiotherapist up in, up in Pimble in New South Wales. And, and many of you uh, I've met before through my adventures through South Melbourne and Caulfield and Geelong and just a few other uh, keys are clinics. Um, Jill will be um, moderating tonight and she's broadcasting live on, on Facebook. So Jill's going to pass on any questions we get from Facebook and, and send them through to me directly on the chat. But if you've got any questions, I'm really open to answering anything um, about detraining and, and retraining tonight. So um, ask away uh, whatever you like and, um, and Jill might pop in occasionally and ask me a question that we've been uh, that we've received from uh, from Facebook. So 14 weeks ago, uh, I stood in I stood in front of uh, the same laptop in the same building because uh, we were just starting isolation, and I, I talked about how to look after your physical health during isolation. And so, uh, hopefully, what I'm doing here is is bookending a period of isolation. I know, un unfortunately, Victoria's taking a backward step in a couple of postcodes um, in the last few days, but hopefully we don't see, um, we don't see too much of that um, going forwards. What I wanna talk about tonight is what, what we need to do or, or what you need to do as individuals to try and rebuild the strength that you may or may not have lost uh, during the last 12 to 13 weeks and how we can back that up with the science. Because hopefully a really big point of difference for us at Kieser is that we will always uh, refer to the science um, rather than um, just relying on hearsay. And the first question that I've had is how long is tonight's session going to last for? So probably about 40, 40 to 45 minutes uh, tonight's session will last for. Um, might go a little bit longer if we have a lot of, of questions uh, to, be, uh, to be answered. And I'll, I'll try and get through and answer all of them. So a couple of little acknowledgements uh, for this presentation. Pro professionally, 
for me, it's really important to acknowledge uh, sources. And Professor Ross Tucker is a, uh, a sports scientist who I, I rate particularly highly, um, as is Dr. James Steele, who are both internationally renowned. And, and James, I had a chat with over the phone. Um, Ross, I've done a little bit of corresponding with via email. So there are a couple of questions that I think that we all should think about um, as people training and, and I'm no different to anyone else. I, I train at Keyser a couple of times a week and so I've you know, missed um, my independent sessions as well. And these, these couple of things are really important and, and they'll make sense as we go through tonight's presentation. Your age will have a big effect on how much strength you've lost and how quickly um, it's gonna take you to, to get it back. Um, how long have you trained for beforehand? Uh, what have you done in the last 11 weeks if, if you live in New South Wales and Queensland or 13 weeks if, you, if you're living in Victoria? And specifically, have you done strength work? Have you done cardio? How hard has it been? Have you been doing upper body stuff and, and lower body things? Um, have you had any pain? Because pain's a massive mediator of, of strength. Uh, and, and we've known that, particularly in an environment like Kiesel, where we have a lot of people who come with back pain and knee pain. Um, and then the, the final one, which is a little bit immeasurable, so I, I don't refer to specifically in the research, is what's your physical and mental sensitivity? So some people know that you know, they, they won't tolerate periods of detraining as much as what other people are. And that goes both from a, a mental and a physical perspective too. So my plan tonight really is to try and take you through um, some of the science. So, some of it might feel a little bit heavy, uh, but I can assure you I will break up um, every piece of heavy science with a really simple fact that you can follow. We'll go through what effect does a short break in training have? Uh, what if I just stayed in bed for 12 weeks and literally didn't do anything? Uh, what if I trained and then I stopped for 12 weeks? I didn't do any training in particular. Does it matter how hard I trained? Um, and I really would like you to, to keep asking questions because I'm going to do my best to give the information that I think is important, uh, but it's going to depend uh, for all of you, um, you know, what you want to know. And I, I don't think that I'm going to answer every single question in, in the slides that I've already planned. So let's start with a short break. And so a short break in training might mean two or three weeks. So hypothetically, we went into the lockdown period, you didn't train for two or three weeks, and then you were able to come back and do the one-on-one -on -one independence, oh, sorry, one-on-one, -on -one, sorry, the supervised um, assisted training sessions with one of our exercise scientists, EPs or, or physios. So if you only had a short break, this is a little bit similar to what they call periodization in strength training. So periodization is to break things into cycles and generally have a week of rest in between uh, weeks of, um, of training. So if you, in, in a study done um, in 2013, they looked at a group of people who did six weeks worth of training um, and then they had three weeks off. Six weeks worth of training, three weeks off. And what they found um, over a 12 week period is that there was really no difference in strength or, or cross-sectional area. So if you've had a really short break and this goes for periods of holiday, you will regain your strength really quickly. So the break of two to three weeks is very, very different to the break of three months that we're now dealing with. So I think we're all pretty accustomed and especially clients at, at Kisa to taking two or three weeks off because we encourage people to have holidays. And the main purpose of strength training is to try and get you strong so you can enjoy the rest of your life. So. Whether you're male or female, this study was done in, in men, but really similar results in, in other studies that have been done in women, two or three weeks will have a, a minimal effect and, and isn't something that we should worry about too much. So the lesson here being three weeks of detraining will have minimum um, effect on your strength over the long term. So I'm going to break up every little bit of science tonight with a, a little lesson like this. So the, the next thing that I said I'd cover is, well, Let's take it to extremes. So let's not call it detraining, let's call it bed rest. So if for the last 12 weeks, you lay in bed 24 hours a day, then you would have very similar outcomes to a group of 23 German males who spent 90 days in a bed rest facility 
60 of them lying in bed at six degrees of head down tilt. That's what HDT stands for. These, this is an amazing study and it was, it was reproduced for the purpose of space travel and space exercise. And they let these guys only get to 30 degrees worth of, uh, 30 degrees off horizontal at any point in 60 days. They were allowed physio once a week and then towards the end they gave them physio twice a week just to move their limbs and create some boredom. But they separated them into two groups. One was called the jump group and the second group was the control. The control group literally lay down for 60 days. The jump group, which is really interesting, did three minutes worth of activity on most days of the week. So five to six days they, they averaged. Uh, and they would just do four sets of 10 counter movement jumps, which is both legs and, and two sets of 10 hops. So we're talking 60 movements, three minutes, and that's all that they would do once a day. And so what these, uh, the researchers, Kramer was looking at is what effect would a little bit of exercise have if you took isolation to the extreme where you were doing complete bed rest. And so what it showed in the control group, who would have thought, no surprise, um, that basically everything goes down. So your bone density goes down. Four point four and a half percent in a 90 day period um, on a DEXA scan is a huge loss in, in bone density. Um, knee extension strength, so that's your, your quad muscles at the front of your thighs, went down by 41%. Um, knee flexion strength, which is basically your hamstrings, a little bit of your calves too, went down by less. Um, plantar flexion, which is your ability to be able to stand up on your toes, went down by 41%. And dorsiflexion, which is lifting your toes up, went down by 7%. Um, you lost a little bit in your aerobic capacity as well. So when you compare this control group to the group who did just three minutes worth of exercise, their bone density didn't change. They lost a little bit of strength still, and they lost a little bit of cardiovascular conditioning. So you don't remember that these people are laying in bed for 23, oh sorry, yeah, 23 hours, 57 minutes every day. They're getting the tiniest bit upright, 30 degrees, just to have something to eat and drink. And three minutes of exercise defended most of their physiology over this time. What I'd really like to point you to is the difference between knee extension and flexion and plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. And the reason I point those out to you is your extensors and your plantar flexors are your anti-gravity muscles. So they're the ones that hold you up. Really, really important, particularly as we age, to keep you mobile and moving. And you can see that those anti-gravity muscles are much, much more affected uh, than the other muscle groups. That's really important when you think about training, but it's also really important when you think about um, where you wanna prioritize your strength going forward. So these things are really important. Your, your bone density going down by four and a half percent makes you really susceptible um, to fractures. So anyone who's got osteoporosis if you haven't strength trained for the last couple of weeks, we know that your risk goes up for a period of time and that getting back into strength training and doing it safely and controlled is really important. And we also know that you will have lost a lot of muscle mass. I'm gonna talk a little bit later about how does how is strength affected and in comparison to muscle mass. So this is a graph over time. <clears throat> And what it shows is that by the end, so these guys had 60 days in the bed rest and then they had um, 15 days at the side uh, to be able to accommodate. And you can see that in the, the darker line um, on this graph that I've just shown, that the jump group got back to their normal uh, lean mass very, very quickly. Um, this is a this is a table that comes out of the study, but I think I've already proven my point here that just a very small amount of exercise can make a huge difference. So bed rest will affect the strength of your lower limbs a little bit more than your upper limbs, um, your strength of extensors the most, 
and it will affect your body composition and cardiovascular health too. And where this is also relevant is for anyone who goes into surgery for whatever reason, they spend two or three or four days in a hospital bed, this, these are some of the results that you might start to see. Obviously, 60 days is, is very different. And when you look at this lesson compared to this, the research coming out of the CSRO during this period of isolation, it's pretty consistent and it shows that most people have had some degree of weight gain during this time. So 67% of people have had a negative effect in their exercise. We can guess that they've probably lost some muscle mass. And two in five people said that they put on weight. So if your muscle mass is coming down and your weight's going up, then we know that you're, that's a pretty significant change in your body composition and something that you want to be wary of when you go to restart training. The other results on the right-hand side uh, just reiterate the fact that um, for a lot of people, their happiness, self-satisfaction with life and mental health has been negatively affected during this time as well. The second lesson coming out of this um, bed rest study is the effects of complete bed rest can be defended or attenuated with three minutes of high intensity exercise daily. Where this is really relevant for us is when you're deciding how much you need to drop the weight down or how long it's going to take you to get back, some of the things that will affect that will be what you did over the 12 weeks of isolation. So if you went for a walk, that's really low intensity exercise. If you didn't do any physical activity, that's obviously the extreme example. But if you did small bouts of high intensity exercise, and that might simply be running and playing with the grandkids, then you're more, much more likely to have defended your, um, your strength, uh, your bone density, your muscle mass, all of those things. So take into account what you've done over the last 12 weeks. This research has been confirmed elsewhere. So this, is, this one gets a little bit heavy, this study. So I tried to summarize it really quickly. They took a, a big group of kayakers, so different study, big group of kayakers who were training 15 hours a week and they randomized them into two groups. One did no training and the other did just three hours of training. So about 20% of, of what they were doing previously. And their loss in strength of in strength and performance over the following eight weeks was 50% less in those that were doing just a little bit of training. So at Kiza, hopefully one of the questions that you've been asked by our physios, EPs or exercise scientists in your first week back is how much physical activity did you do? Because if you did none, then we need to treat you very, very differently than if you did just a little bit. And in particular, if that just a little bit involved a little bit of jumping or a little bit of running or something that was a little bit high intensity, then we would treat you very differently again. So what if I trained and then I stayed pretty physically active for 12 weeks? So in my first example, I went to one extreme. I said, well, what if I laid in bed for 12 weeks? And the second example is probably more similar to most, uh, most people listening tonight um, and, and most people who come along to Kiza who trained and then they just went about their normal everyday life for, for 12 weeks as, as much as they could and as much as we were let outside. So there was a study that was published this year, early this year. Um, the data collection was done last year. So it's almost a perfect comparison. It's great. Where this group did 12 weeks of training then they had 12 weeks of not training. And then they did 12 weeks of retraining again, which is what we're now two or three weeks into. So it's a great comparison for us. And we've talked about this um, as a key as a staff group. <clears throat> this study was done um, in people over the age of 58, which is a good comparison to a lot of people at Kiza. Unfortunately, it was done <clears throat> excuse me, only in men, but all the research suggests that pretty similar results could be expected in women. So it looks perfect, but this group was relatively healthy. So you can expect that people who are, or clients who are unhealthy, so they have some chronic disease, some back pain, some knee pain, probably 
the loss in strength would be exaggerated. I'm gonna, gonna go through the loss in strength now. So it's a perfect comparison for a couple of reasons, but still really, really useful. So I, I think this is the best example for us to be able to look at, to give you an idea of what to expect. So they looked, the exercise that they looked at was a leg press, which um, is B6 for all those people who, who train at Kiza. And a lot of people will, will have this in their program. So over the first 12 weeks of training, there was a 36% increase in strength. So it's about what we would expect to see. In the 12 weeks of detraining, on average, there was a 14% decrease in strength. So what we're quoting for most of our clients is that you, expect, you should expect to lose about 15% of strength, which is pretty similar to the, the poll question that we gave at the start when we asked all of you guys, how much strength do you expect that you've lost? What's really interesting is within the first 12 weeks of retraining, these guys had put on another 24% of strength. So they'd gone beyond where they were to start off with. <clears throat> so you can see this is the training 12 weeks. They go up by 36%, come down by 14% over these 12 weeks, and then go up by another 24%. And somewhere in here, somewhere between... Um, Week four and week eight is when they get back to their original peak. So really simple guideline for expectations is that it will take you about six weeks to get your strength back. And the reason it's important for us to set that goal is that if you train the house down, you train as hard as you possibly can in week one, the research suggests that you probably won't get your strength back much quicker than six weeks. What you do is increase your susceptibility to injury because we know your body doesn't like going from this much activity to this much activity really quickly. Big increases in load or activity, your body, your tendons dislike it, your muscles dislike it, your joints dislike it. It's just a recipe for disaster. So set yourself a goal of six weeks. If you're a little bit older, it should be longer than six weeks. If you've had a little bit of pain during isolation, it should be longer than six weeks. If you're really careful and you don't want to push it, you're really uh, risk averse, then set those goals a little bit longer than six weeks. We're confident that you'll get there. It's not a rush. The most important thing to us is that people get there injury free. So the, the lesson here, lesson number four, is it's gonna take you six to eight weeks to regain your strength. Don't rush. Don't expect to do it in two. Don't be disappointed if you get to four and you're not there. And the second lesson <clears throat> um, is that your strength will be regained before your muscles and connective tissues return to their normal trained state. So <clears throat> that was part of this study and, and another study done out of Sweden, which showed that you will get your strength back before your muscle thickness returns to where it was previously. The reason that's important to understand is that it probably takes about three months for your tendons to respond, to stiffen up, which is a good thing in, in tendons. And so the period that we're concerned about for our clients doesn't just go for six weeks, which is where you'll get your strength back. It goes for 12 weeks where, it'll, where your connective tissues will still be responding. And the question I often get here is, well, why do I get my strength back before I get my muscle size or my tendon size? And the reason for that is that those early gains, just like when you start strength training, those early gains come from neurological improvements. So improvements in efficiency, the message that comes from your brain down to your leg muscles or, or down to your arm muscles. And it allows your body to respond quicker uh, rather than having to wait for your muscles and everything else. So that is where we think some of the, the lessons of, of retraining come from. But they're the two windows that you need to think about. Six weeks for strength, so for performance, and about 12 weeks for your muscle physiology um, to come back. <clears throat> so your body will always protect performance or defend performance uh, more than it will physiology. And that's demonstrated really well in these two graphs. So the one on the left-hand side is your strength or one repetition maximum. And you can see that that really clearly 
um, goes down during the 12 weeks of isolation and bounces back during the 12 weeks afterwards. The cross-sectional area of muscles looks a little bit more all over the place. They can vary person to person, probably subject to a lot more variables um, than what strength is, but your body doesn't have a defined, defined part. Uh, Ingrid, good question about how long uh, before the bone density comes back. Um, so if we separate these uh, two studies, we go back to the, the bed rest study. That's an exceptional example where people are, because they're laying horizontal in bed, losing nearly 5% of your strength, 5% of your bone density in a 60 day period is really, really dangerous exceptionally dangerous and that's the main purpose of a lot of research on exercise for astronauts because when astronauts come back um, to earth and they're subject to gravity again they're really susceptible because they've lost so much bone density in this study here which is the, the 12 weeks of detraining where you're walking around uh, and you're not lying down in bed they didn't look at, at bone density so the first part to that question is in 12 weeks we might expect you to lose a, a small amount of bone density, but not 5%. And what the research shows is that it's probably about a one to one ratio in that you will lose your bone density and regain your bone density at about the same pace. So hopefully, hopefully that's uh, answered your question. Of course, it, as always, it'll vary a little bit depending on what you've done um, during the period of isolation. Oh, gone one, gone one too far forwards. But hopefully if, if you've been able to do any jumping, any bouncing, landing, things like that, you will have defended your bone density. And certainly in any case, you will have defended it much more than a 5% loss that we saw in that you know, over-exaggerated um, example of, of bed rest. So the next question I said I'd answer is, does it matter how hard I trained or how hard I worked? And so this is a really good study <clears throat> where there was two exercise groups and what they looked at was a period of training um, at low intensity or high intensity and then 12 months of detraining. And in the 12 weeks of training in the low intensity group, they saw huge improvements in strength uh, huge improvements in power, and that was an anaerobic power test done on a bike, um, and significant improvements in mobility. So the walk test was a 50 meter walk test. The step up test is how many repetitions can you do in a minute, and TUG stands for timed up and go, which is from a chair up, walking as quickly around a point as you can, and then back to, back to sitting down again. What this same study showed is that if you train at a higher intensity, you'll get much bigger gains in strength. So that's a bit of a no-brainer. Um, we already knew that. And we also know um, from quite a, uh, a large body of research that training at a higher intensity doesn't necessarily increase your, your risk of injuries. At the 12 month point, so after I think it was 48 weeks of detraining, the low intensity group had gone right back to baseline on their strength. The high intensity group had still retained some of their gains. And I've got a slide after this to, to give you a really good example of that in the, the leg press again. Um, in the anaerobic power, in the high intensity group, there was nearly twice as much gain in anaerobic power. Oh, and I've, I've mixed up the order of these. Uh, and nearly twice as much gain um, in mobility. And at the 12 month mark, um, anaerobic power wasn't affected. So both groups had gone back to baseline. But at the 12 month mark for mobility, so what, we, what we're calling functional tasks, like walking, a step up and a timed up and go, the high intensity group um, was still higher. So when asking yourself the question of how much strength did I lose? You need to ask yourself the question of how hard was I training beforehand? And I think that question of intensity is also really relevant moving forward. So people have this perception that oh, higher intensity exercise is going to increase my risk of injuries and that higher weights is going to increase my risk of injuries. And there's really not a large 
body of evidence that suggests that's the case. Um, certainly faster movements seem to in increase people's risk. But if you're doing exercise really safely, slowly and controlled, then higher intensity exercise is probably going to give you, is very, very likely to give you better results than lower intensity exercise. And that's something that we've always been a big advocate of at Kiza than using the right equipment. I'm in, in Pimble, we've got all of our equipment out on the floor out there. And if we're using that equipment in the right way, there's really no reason why at age 50, 60, 70 and 80, that you can't be training at a, at a high intensity. So here's a, a, here's a really good example. So uh, at baseline, the leg press strength using slightly different equipment to ours, but still a leg press. Um, the low intensity group, their one RM was 53. <clears throat> After training, it had gone up significantly to 76. But the high intensity group had gone up even higher. After four months, it had started to come down in both groups. After 12 months in the low intensity group, it was back at baseline. In the high intensity group, it was still in the order of 20% higher than what it was originally. And this is what it looks like uh, really simply graphed. And you can see the peak is higher, the loss of strength by numbers is approximately the same over 12 months. So it means that after 12 months, not 12 weeks, 12 months worth of detraining, um, if you've trained at a really high intensity, you'll still be above what your baseline was. So the lesson out of this is the harder you train, the harder you train, the more strength you will gain and the longer you will be able to defend your gains for during a period of, of detraining. So, if you weren't already uh, a believer in high intensity training or an advocate like I am and, and like all of our team is at Kiza, um, then hopefully this evidence here um, might sway your opinion a little bit. Um, I've got two more lessons here um, that I'm not going to go through in detail in the research. <clears throat> But the first lesson is the older you are, the more strength you will have lost and the earlier you will start to lose it. What I mean by that is if you're 50 and you have four weeks off compared to if you're 80 and you have four weeks off, at the end of four weeks, you will have started to lose strength um, in the 80 year old group. And you're probably still defending most of your strength gains at about three to four weeks if you're in the, the 50 year old age group. So you definitely need to take this into account where well, we've given guidelines that you should drop your weight by 20% if you've been doing some training, 30% if you haven't been doing some training, then I recommend that you go more than 30% um, if you are a little bit older, say beyond the age of, of 75. Max, your question about higher, in, higher intensity being faster than, than 424, it's not related to speed, high intensity. Uh, intensity can be measured a lot of different ways in, um, in the research. Intensity in this case was measured by what percentage of their uh, one repetition maximum, the weight that they were training at, and therefore how many repetitions of each exercise that they were able to do. So the lower intensity group was training at about 50% of their one repetition maximum. And they were doing, and forgive me if I've got the numbers wrong, but about 12 to 13, might've been 14 actually, 14 repetitions. And the high intensity group were training at 82% of their one repetition maximum. And they were doing on average about seven and a half repetitions. So, so the comparison, the really obvious comparison at Kiza is uh, someone who's training at a lower intensity would be someone who's doing the exercise, getting to a three minute mark and saying, yeah, like, that, was, that was hard, uh, but not that hard. I, you know, I could probably could have done a little bit more, but I stopped at three minutes. In comparison, the person who gets to 
two minutes or sorry, 110 seconds and they think, oh, I can't do any more and they get out one more repetition that's like half a repetition and they do 115 seconds in total and that's the maximum that they can do. Both groups move at the same speed, but the intensity of the exercise, particularly in that last repetition, so the amount of fatigue that person has, that's what we talk about when we're talking about high intensity compared to low intensity. So in an ideal world, we would love for all of our clients to be training to what we call failure. So where you cannot complete one last repetition, which doesn't mean where you think you can't complete one more repetition because there's heaps of times where I think I can't complete one more, um, but I can. Um, and it really only counts if your technique is perfect and if your breathing is perfect. So you're not holding your breath, you're not doing a Valsalva mover, you're not holding on really tightly with a lot of other muscles. If you're able to complete one more perfect repetition, um, then you haven't reached complete um, moment, momentary muscular failure is the term that we use. Now keep in mind, this is not necessarily appropriate for everybody. I had a client of mine come in today uh, who's got chronic fatigue and I certainly wouldn't be training her uh, to high intensity. Um, and I've got another client who's coming in just starting a spinal program. Uh, and so he's got a relatively large amount of lower back pain. And so I wouldn't start him training at high intensity. But in the, in the medium term for my back pain patient, I'd like him to train at high intensity. And in the, in the long term, um, you know, we would consider a high intensity for the chronic fatigue patient. So it's the ideal goal for everyone, but you know, maybe not always realistic. Or maybe not always like a short-term goal. So there's a couple of research studies uh, to support the fact that um, <clears throat> The, the older you are, the, the more strength you will lose and, and the quicker you will lose it. And then I've got one, one final lesson, uh, which is that pain's a significant moderator of strength. And if you've had any pain during this period of isolation, um, then you will have lost more strength than any of the numbers that I've suggested tonight. And probably you will recover slower as well. So hopefully what I've provided is a little bit of a window, a little bit of an insight into what will happen to your body um, over 12 weeks of isolation and, and hopefully what will happen over the next 12 weeks of starting to retrain again. Uh, but you definitely need to factor into account your individual circumstances and, and pain is a really big part of those individual circumstances. So there's a whole bunch of references here, which it's really important for me to include um, as a scientist. And if anyone would like a copy of these references, I'm more than happy to share them. They're, they're all publicly available. Uh, they're very scientific in, in their reading. So if you're looking for a bit of light uh, Wednesday evening reading, I, I don't suggest you start with these, but if you do enjoy the science of, of what we do, um, I'm happy to, to pass them on if you would like. And that's the last of my slides for this evening. So I'd really like to just open the floor now to anyone's questions that they've got. Uh, we finished right bang on time, 40 minutes, which is what I said to, uh, to everybody that hopefully we would, we would be done in, in 40 minutes. Now, um, Sandy, I've got, oh, you, you've commented in the chat, Sandy, you've just confused me a little bit there. Uh, yeah, sometimes, so for people who've got a 10 exercise program at Kizo, I mean, really irrespective of how many, um, how many mach machines you've got in there. We wouldn't necessarily recommend increasing every single machine every time. So what we look at as physiotherapists is we look at how much load is going through your body. And so that, mean, <clears throat> that might mean that over 10 machines, you're doing two minutes of exercise on each machine. So you're doing 20 minutes and you've got a certain load in those. If you increased every single machine, your load will go up significantly. So if you're one of those people that's been susceptible to flare ups in the past, and um, there's quite a few clients who have been at Kiesel, then rather than increasing every machine every time, maybe just increase one or two, and then the next session increase one or two of the other ones. Oh, Sandy's gonna continue her comment um, uh, in the Q and A. Benny wants to know, 
uh, why experiencing pain will result in a greater loss in strength? Good, good question, Benny. And I know you know the answer and you're asking on behalf of everyone else, but um, what we know is that pain moderates the strength of your muscles or the activity in your muscles via a reflex that goes back to your spinal cord. And that sounds pretty complicated, but essentially what happens is back pain is a great example. If you experience pain in your back, then you lose not only strength, but muscle size um, in the muscles that as close as possible to where you're experiencing pain. So there's even research studies that show that that loss in strength or loss in muscle size is specific to the side of your pain um, and to the level at which you get your pain as well. The other thing that that research shows is that you don't spontaneously recover that strength when the pain goes away, that you really need to have an exercise intervention um, to be able to get that strength and cross-sectional area back. Why does it happen? It's some degree of protective mechanism for your body. So if you, you're getting a joint that's causing you pain, it makes sense that your body doesn't want to use it. You know, if my knee's sore, my body turns off my quads a little bit so that I don't use my knee as much. Therefore, hopefully allowing it time to recover. I think, well, I think I've answered Max's question. Thanks, Max. I've answered Benny's question. Sandy. Sandy said, you said no more than three machines. That was a perfect guideline. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, I really appreciate that because anytime I went over three, my body fought back. And everyone, so Sandy won't mind me sharing her experience now that a few people have, uh, that, that she shared part of it. Sandy and I uh, took a fair while to work out how we could increase Sandy's intensity, which was our aim, but do it within um, uh, a parameter that her body could cope with. And what we found was that less than three exercises at a time and she could cope with that increase in load. So Sandy went away on a holiday for an extended period of time. We brought her back. Not only do we drop her weights down, but we only increased a couple of exercises um, at a time. So that might be a strategy for anyone else uh, who's having problems. Uh, Tony, I'm struggling to fit in my usual workout into the current 40 minute session. Can you see this opening up to longer sections such as an hour? Yeah, Tony, uh, great question. Um, and the, I think my first part of this answer is thank you uh, to all of our clients who've been so patient and so accommodating um, with the fact that we have had to put a time limit um, on how long people are able to train for and, and have to reduce the number of sessions that people are doing um, per week. Tony, yes, absolutely. I, I can see that opening up to longer. Um, the difficulty in Victoria at the moment is trying to predict when, and, and I'm sure you can appreciate the, um, the activities of the last 48 hours and what the government's done has really has put a bit of a hold on that for now. Um, unfortunately, in, or sorry, fortunately in New South Wales and Queensland where restrictions are slowly being opened up, uh, we will be able to open up that time, but it will really be dictated, Tony, by how many people we're allowed to have in the centre because we want to give as many people as possible the opportunity to train. So hopefully, hopefully we've been really good at communicating to you this whole time and we'll continue to be on the front foot communicating. I just can't give you a date on that at the moment. Look, when, when Victoria goes above uh, being allowed more than 20 people in an indoor space, I think that's probably a pretty good indication. But if you can find out that bit of information from Daniel Andrews, um, you know, we could probably start to make a plan as well. So sorry, I can't give you any definites, Tony, but that's, that's what we're, we're looking for is, you know, more than 20 people being allowed in a keys facility at a time. Uh, Jess has asked question of, would I re recommend people booking a review? Um, and I would say, absolutely. Um, the, a really big point of difference for us at Kiesa is that we want to provide you with um, comfort through supervision or guidance or answering your questions. So 
If you see a physio exercise scientist or EP, have a chat to them and ask them the question. But if you're really apprehensive or concerned, absolutely book in a review session. We're, we're comfortable for all of our clients to be booking in a review session in the next couple of weeks. Some people will be comfortable to come back to training, listen to my guidelines, make their own adjustments and get back onto a normal routine of reviews in the coming weeks. And other people would like to book one of those reviews sooner rather than later. And that's fine. No, no problems at all. I'd, I highly recommend it. There's a reason that we've got the highest trained staff in, in the industry. Um, and it's because you know, we think it helps all of our clients out. Uh, Sandy, I assume there is no problem continuing the at-home training uh, until all restrictions are removed. Abs absolutely, Sandy. Please continue uh, using the uh, the Keyser Connect app. And, and for everyone who, well, everyone now has downloaded it because um, we're not using training cards just for the moment. But um, if you haven't taken the opportunity to have a look at the at-home app, when you open up the Keyser Connect app, you'll see that you have a training in center and a training at home um, option. Feel free to click the training at home option. Have a look through what your training program looks like right at the start of shutdown. We invested quite a bit of time and, and Jill Corfin invested quite a bit of her time taking photos and setting that app up so that your uh, piece of equipment that you have in the keys facility now has a replica piece of replica exercise that you're able to do at home. It will never replace um, how good the keys or equipment is. But, you know, like in answer to Tony's question, at a time where you're not able to train perhaps as much as you would like, um, it's a really good alternative. So I think I've now snuck through uh, 11 questions, uh, answered them all. Um, I'm not in a rush to go anywhere because I certainly, you know, on the invitation, we said we'd be here to eight o'clock. So if anyone else has got any other questions uh, about anything, I'm happy, more than happy to answer it. I might just give everyone one more minute to have a think about it. Um, and while you're thinking about it, on behalf of everybody at, at Keyser Australia, on behalf of our team of nearly 300 team members, I just want to thank uh, all of our clients for their support um, right through the last three months uh, and also for your enthusiasm and smiling faces as, as you come back into our clinics and also for your patience. That example of, of Tony's before, Tony, I'd, I'd love to allow you to train for a little bit longer and I'd love to allow you to be able to train three times a week again if, if that's what you choose. Um, but unfortunately, we are, we're all adapting to slightly new conditions at the moment and it seems we might be adapting for a little bit longer. Um, so thank you for the pa your patience in the meantime. We haven't had any other questions come through, so we might, uh, we might call an evening there, guys. Thank you very much for attending uh, and taking your time out uh, of your Wednesday evening. We'll send you a, a copy of this uh, via email in the next couple of days. Feel free to share it with your friends. Uh, and otherwise, enjoy your return to, to training and enjoy coming back into the Keyser Clinics. We, all, we look forward to seeing you all very soon.